everyone fired up and ready to go? Yes. All right. Uh, uh, my name's Tom Khalil. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, and we have a fantastic panel this evening to talk about the disruptive power of the internet. Um, and uh, I want to uh, thank our web audience. And if you're live tweeting, uh, please use hashtag GPF15. Everyone got that? GPF15 <laughs> is the hashtag. So we have a panel of five distinguished speakers for this session. Um, and I'm going to uh, keep the introduction short because their bios are in the conference, uh, 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 the conference program book. And if I read everything that they've accomplished uh, professionally, uh, that would chew up the entire hour. Uh, so the, uh, the five uh, uh, panelists that we have are uh, Alvaro Bedoya, who's the executive director of the Center on uh, Privacy and Technology at Georgetown Law. He's an expert on digital privacy issues, including big data and cybersecurity, and has also served as chief counsel to the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law to its chairman, uh, Senator Al Franken. Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, Takundu Chikonzo, who is the co-founder of Neolab Technology, which is a startup working to bring free internet access throughout Zimbabwe. Uh, he is also co-founder of Neo Effect, which is a social startup working towards the empowerment of underprivileged youth through IT literacy. Uh, Jeremy Malcolm is a senior global policy analyst at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where he fights for balanced IP laws and policies for open innovation and internet users. users. He recently led the launch of the Manila Principles on Intermediary Liability, a roadmap for the global community to protect online freedom of expression and innovation. Uh, Julia Stash is the newly appointed president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, one of the nation's largest philanthropies. Uh, before her work for the foundation, she served as chief of staff for Chicago's uh, mayor, Richard M. Daly, and the city's housing commissioner, leading an affordable housing initiative and a plan to transform Chicago's public housing. And Darren Walker is the 10th president of the Ford Foundation and a true leader in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors, focusing on uh, global social uh, justice issues, including human rights, urban development, uh, and, and free expression. So uh, this evening, we're going to be talking about the uh, transformative impact that the, that the internet is having on our economy and our society, uh, both here and abroad. Um, and as opposed to uh, a lot of panels that either take a uh, techno-utopian or a uh, dystopian view, either everything's going to get better and there's nothing we need to do, uh, or uh, you know, uh, things are really bad and they're only going to get worse. Uh, I think we have a number of uh, techno-realist uh, participants who are going to talk not only about what some of the opportunities are, what some of the potential benefits of the internet are, uh, but what are some of the really, uh, what are some of the real challenges that we face in, in areas like privacy and uh, surveillance and free speech. Uh, as this audience knows, we've certainly seen an explosive growth of the internet uh, in 1997. Uh, Two percent of the world's population was online. Uh, it is now 39%. Uh, so that's pretty rapid in terms of adoption of a new technology. Uh, but there are big differences uh, between uh, regions. So 76% uh, of the developed country uh, residents uh, are online. Only 13% are in South Asia and 17% in Sub-Saharan Africa. In addition to the explosive growth of the internet, uh, we have also, we're uh, this year celebrating the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law, uh, which states that the number of transistors on uh, an integrated circuit is doubling every 12 to 24 months. Um, so uh, sustained exponential change has really large impact. So in uh, 1971, 
the first microprocessor had uh, 2,300 transistors. Today's microprocessors have 8 billion uh, transistors on them. Uh, so that's what sustained exponential change means. If, how pr if house prices uh, fell at the same prices as transistors, you could, pry, you could buy a house for the price of a piece of candy. Uh, the, the market value of companies that owe their existence to Moore's Law is $13 trillion, that's a uh, trillion with a T, uh, which is 20% of the value of the assets of the global economy. Um, this year, the Internet of Things is projected to connect 25 billion devices to the Internet, so it's not just uh, computers and smartphones, but increasingly everything. Uh, the research community is already thinking about how to connect a trillion sensors to the internet. Um, and the new version of the internet uh, protocol, IP version 6, uh, has enough uh, internet addresses so that we could provide an inter 100 internet addresses for, e for every atom on the face of the earth. Uh, so those are some of the uh, technological trends uh, uh, that, we, that we see <laughs> emerging in the marketplace. So in terms of you know, leveraging the disruptive power of the internet, we're going to start off and talk a little bit about what are some of the uh, potential benefits of the internet revolution. And to kick things off, uh, Chinkonzo is going to talk about some of the benefits of internet access in, in Africa and provide some specific examples of that. All right, so thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to actually speak on this very uh, highly esteemed panel. It's a great opportunity. I'm going to start by telling you a short story about myself. So I'm in the final year of my university studies, and I started working in all these sectors, in, in philanthropy and all of that, four years ago. And when we started, you know, I would get together with my friends and we'd talk about technology. You know, all of our conversations used to start with, you know, what if we could do this and that? And what if we created technology that did, you know, all this and that, right? But the problem was, and it's, it's a challenge with our education system, you know, across the continent, that it hasn't caught up with the level of development that we are seeing the youth, you know, beginning to engage in. And so the question then became, how, where do we learn about building a company from? How do we even get to understand how to do that? And so we turned to you know, the well-known professor, professor you know, YouTube and Google. You know, they, you know, we learned about all these things, about business models and about validation and about all these things. So if, if we start by talking about examples, I believe I'm an example of how powerful the internet in itself is. Not in what I've, I've done before, but in you know, the number of connections that we're able to leverage on. You see, we're going to communities and touch the hearts and lives of you know, 200 other youth who are able to you know, create solutions in these communities that are disruptive in themselves and are sustainable in their development. But this is on a very you know, large scale. Let's go down to the, that individual person who's out there. I always like saying that the internet in itself, it won't feed the hungry. You know? it, won't, it won't cure somebody of HIV and AIDS at this moment. It, it won't do that. But what it will do is it will act as a catalyzing um, mechanism. It acts as a platform that lowers the cost of achieving these goals. All of us in this room are working on healthcare, in energy, in all these different sectors. The internet in itself gives us the reach, the power, the potential to reach all these people at the click of a button, you see. Um, to give specific examples, you know, the number of, if you look at the number of entrepreneurs that are coming out of these emerging economies, the solutions that we're beginning to build, it would have taken us and our governments so much time and money and bureaucracy to find these solutions. What you're seeing now in Kenya is you know, a startup, and I was talking to my colleague uh, who's from Kenya here, you know, a startup that is looking at the number of people who are facing problems in the slums, and quickly and efficiently they create a solution to this. So it is more than just connecting people. It is giving people the opportunity to create solutions that they themselves can carry forward into the community. If you look at the work that, you know, we all talk about trying to educate, you know, the, the younger generation that is coming up, and there's all this, the problem to say it takes $10 million to, to build a school and to get all of this infrastructure working. By leveraging on the internet in itself, we're able to get the content that is relative and realistic to the person who's going to consume it. You get more and more people beginning to consume this data, beginning to fall in love again with the education system, because that is a problem. 
people, students are no longer interested in education because it's not relevant. Leveraging on this power, we begin to see these results. And you know, that's what you've seen in Kenya, you've seen in, in, in all these places. In Zimbabwe in itself, you know, we have a very large you know, telecom company called Econet Wireless, and they created, they zero rated close to 55 you know, educational websites. So all of a sudden now you have all these people who have access to content that they would otherwise have to have walked 10 kilometers to a school to access. And that is the power that we are looking for. It, it brings together the required intellectual resources without having to move them across large expanses of physical time and space. I believe if we begin to look at it that way, we be, we'll begin to see the, the change that we're looking for. But to achieve that, there are a lot of questions that we need to ask. It's not always about getting X number of people onto the internet. We should also now focus on what these people are doing on the internet itself. What right. resources are we providing to them? And so I think if we start looking at those questions, and I'm, I know we're going to talk about this on the panel, we begin, we'll begin to, to realize the power of the internet in itself. Great. So, Julia, I know that the MacArthur Foundation has done a lot of work on digital media and learning, so I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the ways in which you see the internet provides the opportunity to transform teaching and learning. So, thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to tell you that the first thing that I am not going to say is how old I am. And I'm going to tell you why that's relevant. It's because however old I am, there are too many people who are my age that actually say, what's the big deal here? I actually learned just fine myself. And so I think that there are plenty of people my age who see all this happening, but don't actually really get the power that says, it isn't just about the few people who actually learned a lot in the past. It's about how can you have all the people learn everything they need to realize their full human potential. So I think that even though I know that there's some disagreement to this, I think that I would like to suggest that in this room tonight, we stipulate the transformative power of the internet for learning. And as a matter of fact, what we can say is that learning experiences and learning environments are immeasurably enriched by connectivity and the ability to share and the ability to iterate amongst folks and the ability not to only learn within the hallowed surround of the classroom. When you think about simulations and you think about game design and you think about game play and you think about inquiry-based learning uh, supported by stages of knowledge acquisition, I think we can stipulate that the disruptive power of the internet in learning is undeniable. But I think that the interesting thing is to segue from that positive uh, comment to something that is relevant, but much more controversial. And that is the power of the internet and digital technologies to generate information about individual students. And, to, and the ability then to share that data. Now this is good because you can see when uh, young people are struggling with the mastery of a core subject. And you can actually make learning more visible through such things as digital badges. But the question is, how do you find the right balance between privacy and control and access to the rich array of learning ex uh, experiences and uh, assets on the internet? I think at the core of this is how can we ensure that the internet is a trusted environment for learning? Because keep in mind that when privacy and safety are the number one driving imperatives, we absolutely limit the ability to design innovative, customized interventions for young people. It's, excuse me, it's a classic conundrum. Students want to use the internet and digital technologies. They're motivated to do it. But what they don't want is that the data that is generated by that be used for either categorizing or for discriminatory purposes. They want to showcase their successes, but they also don't want to lose control over how they are viewed and how they are valued. Now, parents, of course, want schools to provide the kind of experiences and learning so that their kids can absolutely do, be the best that they can. But they also don't want <coughs> that information, that relationship between a student and a machine to undermine their own parental authority. 
So I think at the core of this is a really urgent need to identify new models of privacy. And so I just, in two sentences, I want to commend you to the Aspen Institute's report on learning in the internet. The name of it is, the name of it is the learner at the center of the networked world. And so the key there, aspeninstitute.org, the key there is really how do you bring the commercial entities, the parent advocates, the philanthropies, the former FCC commissioners, and the um, and school personnel and library personnel all around the table, each with their different perspectives, to say, how can we work to make sure that the learner is equipped and supported to function within the context of all the learning that can take place in the school and outside of it? And so I think philanthropy has a special purpose and to make sure that these kind of tables are set where the people with different goals and perspectives can actually come together around a knotty problem like that. Right. So, so Darren, uh, building on, on what uh, Julie was just talking about, one of the challenges that you've highlighted is that a lot of civil society organizations lack the technical skills and know-how to be able to bring the public interest perspective to a lot of these debates. So can you reflect a little bit about that challenge and, and what role you think uh, foundations can play in helping to address that? Sure, and congratulations, Jane Wells, another great global philanthropy forum. I'm happy to be here, to be, once again, be, be a part of it with, with this remarkable group of people, many of whom I know and admire and have learned from over my many years in the journey. So I think we have a huge crisis in this country when it comes to technology and the public interest. And in some ways, it's the crisis that we had in the 1960s in the law and public interest. In the 1960s, if you were a promising young law student and you wanted to make a difference in the lives of poor and vulnerable Americans, there wasn't really a path for you other than going to work for government, possibly. There wasn't what we now know of as public interest law. And I think over a period of time, and the Ford Foundation, I'm proud to say, was a part of this movement, there was an entire new sector created called public interest law. It started with the a set of grants made by the Ford Foundation to law schools to create law clinics so that promising young law students, while they were in law school, could do public interest law. It started with building a curricula in law school so that people could see a pathway and a career in public interest law. And it started with creating the institutions that ultimately sustained, and one of them, the Legal Services Corporation. All of this is to say, we have nothing like this today for technologists. Today, if you are a promising young coder or computer scientist, and you're graduating and you want to do something in the public interest, there really is, is not a lot to do in, in, a, in a structured way. So what we've been doing, and, and with the very good partnership of, of Mozilla, um, is to fund a set of experiments with fellows who fit this, this model of the, the young, promising um, technologists, and give them pathways into civil society organizations. Because they're, as someone who worked in, in, in a nonprofit for many years before coming to philanthropy, there is such a dearth of capacity in the nonprofit sector today to keep up with the private sector, with government. And so we're interested in how do we create systemically a, a glide path from colleges, universities, graduate programs for these bright young people who want to make a difference. So they can go into work for the right. ACLU or the Legal Services Corporation. Right. It's a very exciting idea. It's We literally in this last round, um, my colleague Ginny Toomey is over there and she has much better data on this. I think we had over 500 
applicants for something like less than 10 fellowships. And so it tells you that there is a thirst and a hunger among young people to make a difference. We need to create the pathway so their aspirations can be fulfilled. Yep. So, I mean, uh, we're certainly seeing that in the, in the federal government where when we actually create opportunities for America's top technical talent to come in for a short-term tour of duty and to make a big difference like fixing healthcare.gov or reducing the time required for our nation's veterans to get the benefits that they're owed. Um, you know, if we're explicit enough about the mission, uh, then we can get them interested in, in serving in the federal government. We're not competing on the basis of salaries and stock options, but we are <coughs> competing on the basis of the impact that they can have if they, if they tackle some of these big problems. Um, one of the things that we want to do in this session is also talk about some of the risks of the internet revolution. And uh, Alvaro, I'm wondering if you could talk about um, not only the, so, some of the major challenges associated with privacy, but the disproportionate impact that the lack of privacy can have on vulnerable communities. Sure. And um, the fact is that over and over again, um, surveillance and a lack of privacy does hurt uh, uh, certain communities more than others. And because of that, I think we need to think about privacy as a civil rights issue. And so let me give you two, two reasons for that. And, and one just kind of came out this month. So the main reason we're talking about surveillance right now is because we recently learned, and not so recently learned, that since 2006, all of our phone calls were being logged by NSA. And uh, uh, what just came out, though, is that since, two, since 1993, all of the international calls in the United States had been logged. This is uh, 13 years before everyone's calls were logged. And this was uh, uh, basically the pilot program for that broader NSA collection. It was the same legal rationale. It was, in many cases, the same modes of collection. And if you take a step back and think, who makes international calls in the United States? Immigrants. Who are they calling? Their friends and family. And so the single largest domestic surveillance program in our country's history was beta tested on immigrants. One point. Second point, looking at history. Uh, a lot of folks in this audience know that uh, Martin Luther King was probably uh, uh, um, the most prominent victim of domestic surveillance uh, in our history at the hands of J. Edgar Hoover. What a lot of folks don't see, though, is that that's just one piece of a much bigger puzzle. Because time and time again, the groups that we now admire and venerate were basically treated like criminals by the authorities and the laws of their day. So civil rights activists, LGBT service members, runaway slaves on the Underground Railroad. Uh, we now see them as heroes, but back then the law said they were doing something illegal. It was illegal to be gay in the military. It was illegal to be black and to march in the streets of Selma. It was legal to own someone and <clears throat> illegal for them to run away. And so as we build this world where we can track even more things, we need to think about whether we're building a world without underground railroads. And we need to think about whether uh, uh, we're building a world where weak and unpopular people cannot dissent because powerful people think that they're doing wrong. So I very much think that we need to look seriously at, at the disproportionate impact of surveillance and the lack of privacy, and that it's a civil rights issue. So, uh, Jeremy, one of the uh, things that uh, we've seen with the internet is the emergence of uh, s reliance on soft law and uh, self-regulation for internet companies. Uh, but you've written about how this uh, can create uh, the opportunities for pressure on internet companies to police content in ways that are done outside the rule of law. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, internet intermediaries, as we also call them, are central to everything that we do online. Uh, internet intermediaries include internet service providers, platforms like social networks, uh, and um, web hosts. And um, I was struck by listening to some of the contributions from my co-panelists um, that often intermediaries are involved even when we don't realize it. So um, when uh, Tokundo was talking about the 
um, educational content that's been made available online uh, when Julia was talking about um, the internet as a trusted platform where we need to uh, make sure that um, privacy is taken care of. And even last night when uh, Bassam Yusuf was talking about um, the use of YouTube as a platform, um, all of this depends on intermediaries. And one thing that also struck me in all of those cases was the power that intermediaries have to act as a choke point or uh, a means of control. And um, so, to back to um, Tokunda's point uh, about the zero-rated content, we're actually concerned about zero-rating of uh, internet content because it creates a sort of a walled garden, and we're worried that the people who um, choose what content will be available and what content won't be available actually have a great power over the users. And um, in years to come, they may see the internet through a very small lens. Um, likewise, the responsibility of platforms to take care of users' privacy, as, as Julia mentioned, um, is something that falls very heavily on intermediaries. And um, so, because they have such a potential to act as a locus of control, um, it's uh, no, no, no wonder why they have been targeted by uh, law enforcement authorities, by rights holders and others as uh, means of uh, repressing content. So um, when this happens according to the rule of law and there is, for example, a court judgment against a particular piece of content requiring it to be removed, at least there's a level of accountability and transparency there. But what we have seen is that intermediaries are often being targeted through these soft pressures. Um, there are various voluntary, quote unquote, voluntary initiatives um, that have been put in place at various levels. Uh, the European Commission has this uh, follow the money program where it targets intermediaries who are seen as profiting from illicit content. Um, the international um, Anti-Counterfeiting Coalition has a, a program uh, directed at payment processes and uh, portal, internet portals, um, whereby they're pressured through, through soft, uh, extra-legal means to remove content. Um, even in the United States, we have a copyright alert system where some of the large ISPs have signed up to a program uh, which is not legislative at all. It's a, it's a self-regulatory program where they can um, slow down the internet connections of people who are suspected of sharing copyright material. Um, many of these examples are examples of IP infringement, but I don't think that that's really the point because IP is often just uh, the first warning signal of a uh, means of repression that uh, is then taken into other contexts. So, for example, there are technologies like um, uh, deep packet inspection that were originally developed often to uh, scan for IP infringements, but which are now used in authoritarian countries to scan for um, a criticism of the government and, uh, and uh, repressing um, the human rights of users in those countries. So, um, in general, we are worried about this trend and uh, uh, in just the last 12 months, it has gotten worse. In February this year, the French uh, president made a statement where he uh, referred to the uh, big operators of social networks and said that um, they, they can be considered accomplices of the material that they host. And he set out the need for a legal framework to uh, hold them responsible for that content and to apply sanctions. Um, this is extremely worrying, not because we want to protect intermediaries, Intermediaries uh, can look after themselves, uh, by and large. Um, we're not so much worried about the effect on their bottom line. We are worried about the effect on the users, um, the freedom of expression, the freedom of association of the users, um, which will be affected if intermediaries are being held liable for their users' content. Because what will happen is the intermediaries will simply stop accepting that content. They'll st stop operating as a conduit or as a host for what users do online. So, um, as, so, as you're... so what do you think is the right response to this? Well, I mean, it, you, you mentioned in your introduction that uh, um, I had been working with uh, 
not only with EFF, but with partners around the world on a set of principles called the Manila Principles on Intermediary Liability, where we try to establish some guidelines, uh, which are in themselves, of course, they're soft, uh, they're, uh, but we are using them to advocate for, in some cases, hard regulation, which would protect intermediaries from being held liable for their users' content, would require, for example, um, a uh, an order of a judicial authority before content is removed um, would, uh, to the extent that not everything can go through the court system, we do allow the law to require intermediaries to notify their users of illegal content. And in those cases, the users oftentimes will uh, respond voluntarily. Um, uh, but there needs to be, in those cases, uh, transparency, complete transparency of the removal or restriction of content and the means of review so that when these uh, mechanisms of control are abused, there is a way to do something about it. Great. So, um, Darren, I know that you have been arguing for the philanthropic community to get more involved in these issues. And so if, if foundations and civil society are not active, and don't have a seat at the table and aren't uh, shaping these decisions, what are the things that you're most worried about? What, what's the potential downside? Well, in some ways, building what Julie said about the sector and the fact that philanthropy, the leadership of philanthropy, would certainly not be labeled digital natives. And I think it is a problem because if you are working on poverty or education, or in the case of the Ford Foundation, social justice, the internet is a battleground. The internet is not, the internet is agnostic about how it's actually used. And like the two faces of the Roman god Janus, it depends on where you stand, what you see. Mm -hmm. You can see evil and destruction, and you can see beauty and free expression. And what determines what you see is all about the rules of the road, the rules of engagement, for being on the internet and the policy that shapes, monitors, manages. And, and so what we in philanthropy find ourselves, quite frankly, is, is caught flat-footed because we don't understand this technology stuff. And I'm generalizing, I think there are certainly some uh, some foundations and some uh, sectors in, in philanthropy that do. But for the most part, if you go and talk to any large foundation president, and I can only speak for the sector I know, which are larger foundations, you're not going to have a conversation with someone who's really interested in this issue. And, and that's a shame because we don't have much time to save the internet. And there have been some important victories, most recently with net neutrality, but there is so much more to do, and, and there is domestically, globally, real questions around policy. And so I just ask my, our colleagues in philanthropy to really recognize the importance of this from wherever you sit, and don't look at it and, and, and think of it as one person said to me, well, we don't, we don't wire libraries. We don't, and it was, and it was like a 1990s statement uh, about wiring libraries. And, and it, was, it was dumbfounding that, that a major foundation president actually thinks that if you're a foundation and someone says, let's talk about working on technology, that what you should want to talk about is wiring libraries. Right, but w what... <coughs> What, what's an example, you know, we, we talked about net neutrality, but what's an example of something that could go either way? Uh, and well, let's just, I mean, let's just look at, at, so we work on racial justice at the Ford Foundation. Right. So on the one hand, what happened in Ferguson was, was horrific. 
and and but in in 1965 Dr. King gave a, a famous talk and in and in the south bureaus of major networks decided they weren't going to carry because it was too controversial and they didn't and so people in the south didn't see and some southern cities didn't see his speech well in ferguson the amazing thing was the, the moment, at every moment, we had granular evidence of what was going on on the ground right. because of technology. Mm -hmm. Now, that's good. Right. Let's look at the bad side, racial justice. The surveillance that goes on of particular communities that turn out to be communities of particular color and particular class is, is endemic. And Alvaro just spoke of it from the perspective of civil rights, but we have, we have a regime and a scheme that allows discriminatory practices, whether it be in lending, whether it be in criminal justice, in education, that, that perpetuate the same inequalities that we have had in our analog world, now in our digital world, are just recreating themselves online. And so I'm simply saying, again, it depends on right. where you sit. Right, right, right. Okay, thanks. Can I just add one tiny yeah, comment absolutely. to that? I actually think the notion of just being recreated online is not uh, a powerful enough statement. I think actually what's being created online has a much more algorith algor algorithm ick <laughs> nature to it. It has a much more automated nature to it, which I think is even scarier for its potential discriminatory uh, power and to isolate people from uh, opportunity. So I think we have more to be scared about now as we cede power to automated sorting that is possible with the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, Alvaro, is that something that the uh, public interest community is looking at, the increasing uh, fraction of decisions that are being made uh, automatically using machine learning? And yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And um, it touches on what Darren and, and, and Julia both said. Um, let's look at lending and credit, right? And so for years and years, your credit score has been determined on, you know, how many credit cards do you have? How many loans do you have? Do you pay them on time? And increasingly, it's turning on things like, do you pay your phone bill on time? Do you pay your rent on time? And increasingly, in, a sm in smaller instances of growing, it turns on things like, how many friends do you have on Facebook? <laughs> do you buy bird seed? Oof. Do you have those little sliders that go underneath your furniture so they don't scratch the wood? Now, uh, this cuts lots of different ways, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Because there are gonna be a lot of low-income people out there who right. are thin or no file, and, uh, uh, but you better believe they pay their rent on time and they pay their phone bill on time. And so those folks might get access to credit that they couldn't before, but then there's two questions. The first is, what kind of credit do they get? And in a world where credit isn't just, you know, what determines the kind of money, you, uh, you know, that determines the amount of money you get, uh, but also is used for employment checks, is it better to have a poor credit score rather than no credit score? First question. Second question, you know, I was born in Peru, came here when I was five, and uh, where I grew up, uh, I grew up in the city, and uh, we had, you know, stone or towel floors. I had no idea that these little furniture sliders existed, right? Uh, uh, and you better believe we didn't buy bird seed, right? So pigeons would come eat. And, and so uh, um, we have no idea how a lot of these fringe uh, 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 mechanisms of evaluating credit are going to evaluate people. And the last thing I'll say is that that's a disparate impact, impact argument I just made. What I can tell you categorically exists today are lists of people sold by data brokers to creditors that say things like, this is a list of low English proficiency Latinos who you, you should target for a payday loan. 
That is a real list that exists in this world and was previously available for purchase before a woman named Pam Dixon got it taken down. There are lists of people uh, uh, with Alzheimer's, people uh, uh, with diabetes, people who have sexually transmitted diseases, and these lists are up for sale right now, and you better believe that they aren't just used for marketing. So uh, there's a number of ways in which both algorithmic decision making and the opacity of what's called lead generation is going to have a disparate impact uh, and facilitate discriminatory intent for certain populations. Um, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Let's think about that. I have some happy stuff to talk about, too, but... He's the dead <laughs> counter on this panel. <laughs> I do have happy stuff. More wine. Um, so, the next topic we want to talk about is, uh, is governance. Uh, and one of the things that we've been talking a lot about so far is that in this area, um, it's not just the decisions that are made by nation states. Uh, as important as those are, but it's also the decisions uh, that are made by large technology and, and uh, social media firms that can have a big impact on, on outcomes that we care about. So, uh, so Julia, how is that, uh, how is that fact, the, the large impact uh, that firms can have shaping the way the MacArthur Foundation thinks about this area? Well, first of all, I want to say I love working with Darren. We are a perfect cohort here of new from the inside guys, and we think alike on so many things, but I want to push back on a tiny thing. I love the fact that Darren used the words rules of the road. That is a quaint phrase that is really going by the wayside because the rules of the road are the terms of service. And so when you think about terms of service as the new governance mechanism, Think about all the people that believe that the internet is a, a public square. As a matter of fact, technology and social media, but not just those companies, corporations of every style and shape are actually defining the rules of the road. I mean, Im just imagine the fact that um, uh, Facebook has a billion uh, customers, a billion users, and the terms of service are what are actually governing how one billion people use that platform for their own personal use, their social purposes, the civic purposes, business purposes. Now, think about this. How many times have you clicked, I accept? Do you have any idea what you have just accepted? I mean, as a matter of fact, could you even name five provisions of Facebook's terms of service? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. What you say, if a billion people have said yes, it must be okay. As a matter of fact, it's not always okay. But think about the impact of this when the very early purpose of Facebook was uh, social interaction. It has grown to quantum times for uses. Teachers use it to assign homework. Uh, civic organizations and individuals use it for organizing. And businesses use it to interact with their customers. And the fact is, we have now permitted, whether it was even possible to not permit, we have now permitted organizations with private interests profit-seeking motives to actually write the rules for privacy, security, personal control of our data, and in all those areas of those activities, in the lives of a billion people. That's sort of a, that's sort of a mind-boggling proportion of the world's population. So think about that. That is more consequential than almost, I say almost, any single government. Now, keep in mind that some people have called for sort of a Magna Carta in this uh, arena, uh, which would be a way that users would come to agreement with Facebook and others on people's basic rights. I mean, this goes to the notion of could we ever think about privacy really as a, as a civil right? And how does that then get embodied in documentation? So about a year ago, Tim Berners-Lee said the web was under attack from government and from corporate influence. And what was needed was new rules, sort of like a digital bill of rights in each country. 
think about how, what that means, each country, and what the different cultural context is in each country. Different views about privacy, different, even different views about association and free expression. But this would be a statement of principles that would be supported by users and government officials and corporate representatives and public institutions, and it would address all the issues we've been talking about, privacy and association and free speech and responsible anonymity, things like that. Now, this is a big idea, and maybe it's a good idea, and maybe it's a bad idea, but it's an idea that I think it would be actually really hard to get from the beginning to the end. So I'm thinking that maybe a better, quicker way is to get at some of these issues, perhaps in the way I talked about earlier, which is to sort of segment the problem and begin to address it with the right people around the table. The corporations, the governments, the users, the, the parents, all of those, and say, how can we grapple with those issues within the context of a very concrete uh, domain like education. And once again, I think philanthropy has a role to play here because philanthropy has a, can have a single, a singular focus on within the context of competing interests to focus on public good. So I can be optimistic at a small scale, more pessimistic at the large scale. <laughs> but don't you think, Julie, that it's, yes, you can sector by sector say, let's get education together, let's get the academy together. But there's got to be, I mean, Tim's, Tim's aspiration is consistent with his vision when he created the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. and, and that is that there would be a global regime that, that and a platform that made it possible for the globe to be connected. So we need global governance. It is true that we need, uh, yes, it's great, we can set tables, but, but ultimately, nations, people, must have some consensus on, on what the rules of the game are. What the terms of the service the of the game are? <laughs> whatever we want to call it, whatever the yeah. laws are, whatever yes. the policies yeah. are, what we, because what will happen is if we, if we again, um, allow it to happen, it will, it will, it will um, reinforce the, the biases and the disparities that we currently see. So, so those in the global south, those in poorer countries, will will lose and those of us in richer countries who already have the advantage that those advantages will be reinforced if we don't give power to those those countries those regions that to get to today are are behind the eight ball and need to catch up mm -hmm. and so there's got to be some uh, agreement that we need a focus on on true real global governance and i know that is scary to a lot of people because it means, oh my God, are we gonna to have to go to the UN and create a commission or whatever? But I, I think we've gotta deal with it at that level. And I mean, our colleagues here are better suited than I to so, speak to this. So Jeremy, you, you've thought a, lo a lot about this. How do you have uh, multi-sector governance in a world of 196 countries that don't agree on oftentimes on fundamental values? What, what opportunities do you think you uh, there are for the types of uh, governance that, that Daryl was talking about. Yeah, I do see the prospect of 196 different Magna Cartas for the internet as being unmanageable. Uh, I think that speaks for itself. Um, and um, so traditionally we have been thinking in terms of a global um, internet governance regime that would be conducted in a multi-stakeholder fashion where we would get um, the governments and the IT companies and the users together. Um, I think that vision has faded a little in recent years as we've seen the exactly what Darren mentioned, which is that the inequalities that we see offline are being perpetuated online, or as Julia said, maybe even being magnified online. And, and we've found that so-called uh, multi-stakeholder processes are actually really just whitewashing existing power structures or, or worse, maybe even turning corporations into... Um, you know, giving them extra power to, to self-regulate rather than going through democratic processes. So I have seen a, a loss of faith in, in that vision, um, but I still think it's worth um, investing in. I think it's a shame if we um, 
politicize the concept of global multi-stakeholder governance in terms of being something that uh, the, the left, for example, is against. Um, I think if there's a better governance uh, structure to be considered, then it should work for libertarians, progressives, uh, uh, liberals, um, it should work for everyone. Um, and there's some work to be done, I think, in sifting the wheat from the chaff there and maybe setting some standards for what do we actually want to see in a multi-stakeholder governance model? What is the sort of gold standard or the, the quality seal that we want to see these multi-stakeholder structures um, exhibiting? And um, so I don't think we're there yet, but ultimately the aim is to reach um, a situation where the perspectives of uh, the powerful and the powerless are, are balanced and um, where everyone's voice is represented in some way and hopefully we can avoid um, just a capture of that process and, and the power structures being replicated, um, but that's a difficult thing and we're certainly not there yet. Great. Uh, Takunda, what, what would you like to see African governments do? What role could they play in terms of expanding access and promoting competition and uh, having low prices for, for internet access? What constructive uh, role would you like to see African governments play? Okay. Um, so I was just about to comment on that and to say the whole notion of uh, global sort of governance, right, in itself might sound or seem to be okay, but it we then begin to beg the question to say, does it then not limit the manner in which the internet is going to be adopted in emerging economies in Africa? Because from our research, from the work that we have been doing, we realize that the, the manner in which the internet is being adopted in emerging co economies is totally different from what we have seen in, in first world countries. The reason why our technology, for example, with SISA is able to achieve uh, efficiencies of almost 10 times is because we're leveraging on the culture in which data is being consumed. And so when you then talk about government involvement, I think the first and most important thing is for governments to actually get with the program. You see, the adoption of the internet in our context has largely been fueled by the disruptive innovators in these spaces. And these are the small companies, the coders that you were talking about, the startups, right? And it is in this manner because the adoption of the internet in, in emerging economies has been almost a need-based. I will use the internet because there is this particular resource that I want. Reason being because it's very expensive. In, in general, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, the cost of internet, you know, just for 10 megabytes of data is a dollar, which is the same cost of one loaf of bread. You see, and so most of these people have been using the internet based on need. I need to communicate and therefore use the internet for that. There is a particular health resource that has been made available and therefore I'll use it for that. So the, the challenge now is that most of our governments haven't created the policies and the structures uh, to allow these disruptive innovators, these startups to work in that space. I know of a good number of startups in Kenya, in South Africa, in Ghana, in Zimbabwe that are trying to leverage on technology that is fairly new, TV white spacing technology for example, to afford this, this, this reach, because we all talk about our, our Africa is going to leapfrog in terms of technological advancements, right? But there is no legislation to do that. In most of these governments, you'd find that issues to do with uh, privacy, with governance, with uh, the regulation of the spectrum, with technology, it's, it's across multiple you know, entities within the government. And so trying to coordinate that in itself is a challenge. You talked about the whole notion of lowering uh, the cost of, of access, right? I think also, and this is, we've seen this in, in a lot of first world um, countries, but not so much in emerging economies, the whole notion of infrastructure. Because infrastructure, the whole notion of giving internet access is based on infrastructure. But I think what we need to see governments doing more is trying to foster the whole notion of shared infrastructure. When you have so many internet intermediaries, as you have, not, as, as you have um, mentioned, you know, affecting the value that is actually getting to the end person, and if each and every single one of them is doing investments in their own assets, in their own this and that, then we won't get to a point where we will lower the cost in itself. We have governments that have tried to look at, uh, at models where they themselves offer free internet access, right? And whilst it is noble in itself, it is not sustainable from a government point of view they need to get those partnerships going. An example would be the work in South Africa with Project Isiswe, uh, where you have a, a private company that's working with municipalities to provide free internet access. Such a model works because there is that collaboration and cooperation. But we haven't seen that across you know, um, all entities and, and, and communities across Africa. So I think there's a whole lot of work that government has, government has to do, and it all lies essentially in 
fostering the collaboration that we need in acknowledging the fact that it's not the existing uh, internet intermediaries, the ISPs, the AIPs that have the solution, but it's those people who are creating the value, the technology. The reason why we want to connect to the internet is not because an ISP is giving it. It's because somewhere in some room, there is a young gentleman who created the service, WhatsApp, for example. That is what we want to use. And right. so govern governments have to support that because that is what is driving the adoption of the internet in itself. I think that's where the real value of, 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 of involvement is. Thank you. So we're going to wrap up now with a lightning round. So I want all the panelists to remember Rene Pascal, who said, I'm sorry this letter is so long, but I did not have time to make it shorter. Uh, so, uh, so we're going to start with uh, Daryl. If, if you had uh, one thing that you would really like to see the philanthropic community do uh, in this area, what would it be? I would say invest in the human capital that we need to transform our sector and to advance our missions. We need a new generation of talent that is desperately needed and will be needed to do the work that we are all charged with. Okay. So I think that we should address the very challenging situation which says just as the world is becoming more dependent for so many things on the internet and related technology, there is a loss of trust in them. So I think that we should spend some time on figuring out what it is going to take to actually restore and sustain trust in the internet so that we can actually use it to realize both human potential a just world and all of the things that I think that what are what we want in this room. Alvaro? Yeah, I actually want to echo and expand on what uh, Darren said. Um, I think there's a really serious pipeline problem and it's both uh, we need engineers who are familiar with public policy and, and uh, law and making change there and we need lawyers who are comfortable talking with engineers. And I honestly think that um, if we're trying to fix NSA, et cetera, there's a legal reform and there's also technological reform. I sincerely think there are some math problems that if we solve them would go a long way in, in curbing excessive surveillance. Um, and so I, I echo the pipeline problem. Tukanda? I say invest more in the entities and elements that are disrupting and creating the technology and value that is propelling the internet in itself. Invest in those startups that are working and building innovative solutions in healthcare to address the communities that they are living in. Work with those people because it is in that technology that you'll see more adoption. It is in that technology that you'll see, you know, in as much as we want more people to get onto the internet, Working with those people who result in having these people on the internet using it for the greater good, for the resources, for the power that we're talking about today that they need to leverage on. So we need to see more uh, to do with those who are disrupting and building the technology itself. These are the startups. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, returning to the theme of global governance, I think we are already seeing um, global governance mechanisms emerging sort of under the radar to cover a whole lot of internet issues through trade agreements. And that's actually quite worrying. We're seeing not only IP, but also rules on cross-border investment and uh, the free flow of information um, being conducted in a very closed and non-multi-stakeholder fashion. Um, perhaps some investment in coming up with some better practices for trade negotiations that impact on internet issues. Great. Um, I have one housekeeping announcement, which is that uh, tomorrow morning there's going to be a breakfast session on the sustainable development goals, all 390 of them, uh, at 7.30. Uh, and the first uh, plenary session uh, will begin here at 8.30. Uh, so please join me in uh, thanking the panelists for a terrific job. <laughs> <laughs>